All right, Matt is doing good. Welcome to Church in the Village this morning. So glad to see your face today. If you'll stand with us, we're going to lift up our voices, sing the unstoppable God.
song that we sang for the first time and I'll see him coming. And one of the lines that kind of started this whole song for me was the scripture that I read last week and it's where Jesus encountered the woman at the well in Mary Magdalene. And uh, she's talking to him about, you know, worshiping him. And, uh, <coughs> and he says to her, you know, there's going to be a time where you're not going to worship on the mountain in Jerusalem or in this mountain in Samaria, in the area. But the true worshiper will worship in spirit and in truth. I don't know about you, but sometimes in the Bible, like, I'll read things, and it's like, okay, yeah, but I don't really understand what it means, what that means, and that's one of those things where it's like, I kind of, like, hid it away in my heart, but I was like, Lord, what does that mean, to worship you in spirit and in truth, like, what is this talking about, what are you talking about, and um, for years, it's just something I, like, kind of chewed on, but y'all, if you haven't watched last week's new series, if you have not watched The Chosen, it's a series people in the Bible that we know and love, and it is amazing. It will blow your mind. So you can watch the first episode on YouTube. I'm going to plug this. But anyway, one of the episodes, it's about this encounter that he has with this woman at the well. And it so affected me, like several of the little fear, I mean, like stories have affected me in a, in a big way, but this one was like such a hard one. Um, this encounter that they have, and he really sets her free by letting her know that she's, she can worship him in spirit and in truth, and he is the Messiah, of course, and he reveals that to her. She's the first one he reveals that to, um, as far as, like, the masses that she's carrying in her heart. And it changes her life so much that she runs back and tells everyone, i got to tell everybody, you know, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. I don't know him. Well, so in spirit and in truth, you know, so after that, like, I just kept thinking about the show, and I'm like, what are you saying? It's, it's really cool how the Lord Spirit uses like different things to reveal his word to you. But um, one of my friends did a post about being a, a mom, a stay-at-home mom of a little girl. And she's like, you know, I went to church for the first time in three weeks, you know, and, and I was really looking forward to like worshiping him. And so, you know, I put my baby in the nursery and I was like, okay, I'm going to pray. Sure enough, about 10 minutes into worship, or maybe not even that much, the number comes on the screen, and it's her child in the nursery. That's her number, and she's like, oh, I love my baby, but I just wanted to sit here and worship. <laughs> and she said the Lord began to reveal to her, your life is daily worship. And so she talked about, like, you know, at the kitchen sink, like, that's my altar, my altar of worship. And she's like, you know, be dressed in the morning. That's my altar of worship. Just wherever she is, you know, he's like, you can worship me wherever you are. And so I was thinking about her post, and Brian and I were kind of discussing, like, what do you think that means when he says to her? But what he knew is he was getting ready to go and die on the cross, which would actually rip the veil of the temple in two, which we know signifies that we now have access to God, right? And 50 days later, it says they were all filled with the, the Holy Spirit of God. And so what happened when Jesus died on the cross, you didn't have to go to a temple and make these sacrifices anymore. Jesus became the sacrifice. And then when he filled us with his spirit, we became the temple. And so when you are the temple, you can worship wherever you are and in his presence wherever you are. So as we were kind of talking about that, I was like, oh, my goodness. Like, I kind of knew that from this text, but that's what he was talking about to her. There will come a time, and this literally just down the road, where I'm going to die. You're no longer going to be the temple, because those who follow me are going to fill you with my spirit. You will be the temple. And that means that wherever you are, you don't have to be on this mountain you're standing at your kitchen sink washing your dishes, guess what? The temple is there. His holy presence is there. And you can worship him in spirit and in truth and genuinely. Wherever you are, you don't have to be here on Sunday to worship the Lord. You can worship him sitting at a ball field talking about him, you know? You can worship
worship him sitting in your chair beside your bed, getting out his word, thinking about you and just talking to you. You can worship him because the tempo is sitting in the car as you're driving. You can worship him, not on this mount, but that mount. You can worship him in your spirit because you have his truth. And when that comes,
Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for that amazing love and, and screaming that word hallelujah out this morning. Lord, we thank you for a time that we can devote to, to start off our weeks or even end our week and just get a little bit of refreshment, a little bit of glimpse of glory and, 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 and be in wonder, wonder of you. Lord, I pray the time left that we have together this morning that, that you just continually work in our spirit the truth of your word and your love and your grace and your mercy. Lord, and I pray as, you, uh, as we take up the offering that you bless the offering. Let us love this village like it's never been loved. Let us be instruments of, of reconciliation. Let us just be instruments of, of people that just put pieces back together. Let us be the glue of, of the relationships that may be broken in our communities, in our families. And let us do that out of, out of the love that you've done that for us personally. So use that. Glorify that gift that, 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 we be, that we're giving this morning. Lord, I pray as, as it comes time to open our word in here and, and with Kids Village, Lord, that, that you supernaturally just speak through us. Let somebody's life just absolutely be different as they leave this morning. And we ask this all in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated, kids. You can head on over with Miss Tiffany and Mr. Matt and Miss Joyce. So you guys head on over there. Um, thank you, Amber, this morning. A <clears throat> um, couple things as we get rolling this morning. The first one is this Thursday, fe February 13th, we're going to partner with the Carlisle Head Start, I believe, right? Is that still a thing, sis? Er, my bad, Early Learning Center, Ch name change, I wasn't aware of. Um, and uh, we'll be at Chautauqua, and uh, what time should we be there? Uh, five would be great, the dance starts at six. If you just want to get after it and boogie a little bit, and that's all you want to help out with, you're more than fine. Um, we typically will serve um, s the food that's there. We're going to do popcorn this year. Heather's requested not the cotton candy machine. Putting that, I'm, I'm okay with it. Don't look at me. <laughs> well, there you go. Apparently, we might do that too. You just, you just lost all your, you just lost all your volunteers, Heather. So <laughs> um, but if you want to come out for that, um, come on out. Um, I know some teenagers need, um, some teenagers need some community service hours to help them out a little bit, and. Um, and so the, we can sign off on that, and we can do all that and all that good stuff. And you get to probably eat a little bit. Um, and you can dance a little bit, right? And you can make connections a little bit. So come out and do that. That um, will be good. Men, this coming Saturday, February 15th, we're going to have another men's breakfast. And uh, we're going to be at the ministry center at 8.30. We're going to eat. I'll bring some biscuits and gravy. Um, and we'll have some juice and milk. And we'll have all that good stuff, all right? And uh, so come out for that 8.30. And um, just for some good fellowship with each other. Um, if you can make it. If you can't make it, let me know. Maybe we can Skype you in. Um, I'll make my homemade biscuits and gravy <laughs> that are made at home. <laughs> that aren't really homemade <laughs> that I just throw in there. So come out for that. Enjoy that. And something that just got brought to my attention, I've been working with, with Nick's dad, Nick Richards up there, his dad, Dan. Um, there's a family in our community whose dad had been diagnosed with it's lung cancer, I believe, right? Um, the Nickel family, Pete Nickel. Um, some of you guys know Lauren and Taylor. Um, and they graduated from Carlisle a few years ago. And uh, because Nick and his family... Um, this community, this village just absolutely wrapped their arms around them in a, in a struggle with his brother, Zach. Um, Dan just feels like it's his, this is his mission to Carlisle, and, and he wants to help out the Nickel family. So, Dan, if you don't know Nick's dad very much, um, Dan is, he's competition-level competition, competition level barbecuer, right? And I'm talking like multiple smokers, and he's got a new smoker. So he decided on February 22nd, he reached out to us. He wants to use the ministry center He's going to smoke some some pork pork shoulders and pork butts, all that kind of stuff, and make some pulled pork. 
and he's going to sell dinners for $10. He's going to do his famous sides, baked beans, mac and cheese. He's going to do all this, and he's donating everything basically on his own. And he asked if we would like to help as a church, if we'd like to come out and maybe serve some meals for some people, if you'd like to get a, a time slot that you would like to work, we're going to start at noon until we run out, out of food, right? And all the money, 100% of the money is going to go to the Nickel family. And uh, his goal is to serve 300 dinners, and uh, the dinner you'll get your three sides, your meat, and all that for 10 bucks. But the 10 bucks, 100% of it, will not go to anything other than the family. So us as a church and Mr. Richards is going to provide everything else, and so 100% of the money will go to the Nickel family. Um, we're going to kind of, I told him, we'll set it up like if they want to eat there, they can, or if they want to go. If they want to get it to go, they can go. So we just may be some people to help serve or anything like that. So if you want to do that, Nicole will create a sign-up, and we'll get all that taken care of. And uh, so I don't think I'm missing anything else. Um, that was a lot there. So remember, Thursday, Saturday, and then a week from Saturday. So um, <clears throat> I love um, spending time with my mother-in-law. Um, I know that makes – she's in Cleveland right now, so I love it even more. No, I'm just playing. Um <laughs> I, I love going down to Kathy's, right? And Kathy's, I'm not going to tell you how old Kathy is. Um, we share the same birthday, but not the same birth year, um, which makes sense, right? I married her daughter. That would be really awkward if we had the same birth year. But uh, every time we go to Kathy's, we try to get there around 5.30, 6 o'clock, eat some dinner. But there's two shows that anybody that's over a certain age has to watch at like 7 o'clock. Does anybody know what those are? Will of Fortune and Jeopardy, <laughs> right? <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> well, Becky's up top and she's on it right now. I'm not for sure why my sister's on it. She's not that age yet, but I mean, you got to start off with Will of Fortune and then you finish with Jeopardy. I'm at mom and dad's house. Jeopardy signifies it's time for dad to go to bed, um, so he goes. <laughs> So he goes to bed, um, but we'll sit down. I love watching Jeopardy with Kathy because me and Kathy, like as soon as the question comes on, we shout out the question. Th this was very tough to write out because you get, you want to say you shout out the answer, but you don't shout out the answer. You shout out the question, and, and and so it's like a race between me and Kathy, and usually I win because I am filled with useless knowledge. Um, but so we're, we're, we're doing this, we're playing this game and we know like every answer it's crazy, right? But if you were to put me and Kathy on the show, what do you think would happen? We'd freeze up, you know, that buzzer they say is the hardest thing in jeopardy. I love watching some guy that doesn't have good buzzer etiquette because like if, it, if they got it on him, asked a question, he's like, <laughs> you know, that would be me, right? My face would just go <laughs> because I'm just trying to win it. And then you got the calm guys that usually win. They're just like. You know, but my face, but we would freeze up and we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be able to give the correct question to, to the answer, right? We would be like, uh, what is uh, Nicole? No, sir, that would be Napoleon. It would be, you know, it, that's what I would do, you know, because when, when I get up here and I kind of feel like I'm going to freeze, right? I look for my wife and I'm usually okay. That's why sometimes I mention her and she's not in my notes because she knows if I mention her name, I'm way off where I'm supposed to be, but... But I would totally freeze playing that game. And, and sometimes on our hill journeys, we can learn all the knowledge that we can about God. You can dive in and you can learn the history and you can learn um, the creation story. And you can learn all the, the laws that are in the, the, the Pentateuch. And you can learn all the stories of all the prophets and all the, the kings and know songs by heart and proverbs and you have all this knowledge and, and and how he wants you to move with your life but if we don't use that knowledge and just freeze in the knowledge to take the step, steps of faith every day in our journey what good is the knowledge what good is the knowledge of knowing everything about god if you don't take steps in following god so we're to a point in luke chapter 16 um, and, and we're going to be reading verses 14 through 17 this morning of the Pharisees finally get something in their brain. So here in, in verse 14 it says this, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, now remember last week, the last thing Jesus says is, you cannot, no servant can serve two masters, right? You can't love God and love money. That's what he said towards these guys. Verse 14, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, 
wow, isn't it amazing that Jesus knew exactly who he was talking to? Heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you, you are those who justify yourself before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among, among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law of the prophets were until John. That's John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist is the one that signified Jesus was coming, right? He was the prophecy that broke 40, 400 years of silence. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. So finally in the text, the, the Pharisees get that Jesus is kind of talking to him, them, right? And, and what's into their, what, what, it, what their hearts are into, and they begin to ridicule him, poke fun at him, laugh at him. Say, this is stupid. You don't know anything, sir. Which signifies a point that isn't really what my sermon's about this morning, but it is there's times that you get ridiculed, but I want you to understand even Jesus got ridiculed because when somebody gets hurt, hurt people hurt people. They knew no other tactic than, oh, this guy. So they made fun of him. So, so listen, there's times in your life somebody's going to hurt you, but you've got to understand that hurt people hurt people. Right? Brokenness can create brokenness if it's not being put back together. And, and so they began to, to hit or to ridicule Jesus with their knowledge of the law. Like the rules that we have. But the real issue with these religious leaders and lawyers wasn't their knowledge of God. It was how they used this knowledge in their own lives. So two questions as we get rolling this morning. And the first one is simply this. What is the most important piece of knowledge you can have of God? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal it to you this morning. And the second is this. What is greater than knowledge? What's greater than knowledge? So the missing piece. You guys have, have heard this many times in my life. I'm not very good at, at putting things together. Um, you know, I look at some guys in this room, and you guys, you can do it, right? Um, matter of fact, like every man in this room except me. <laughs> I'm looking around, can do that. I feel very insignificant right now. <laughs> like I've got mechanics, HVAC guys, <laughs> like carpenters. Uh, I mean, I've got like the real deal and then me. So, man, maybe I shouldn't talk about this right now. So insignificant right now. Um, um, but when Nicole will buy a piece of furniture from Ikea, right, and then Dave walks in, which builds things out of nothing. Like, why am I talking about this right now? Man, <laughs> I mean, Dave could be like, hey, there's two sticks. And then next thing you know, he's built a hut for everybody. But, you know, um, so when Nicole buys something from Ikea, I'll get it out. Number one, anybody that's ever bought anything from Ikea to put it, there's no words in it. It's just pictures. And, and like, sometimes they forget to tell you which side's which. It's just, it's a headache in itself, but it gets done. But when we buy it, they don't, like, really even tell you how many pieces of, like, screws and nuts and bolts that you're supposed to have. So I, <laughs> I'm afraid to say this with everybody that's looking at me right now this morning. I always have a ton of those screws and nuts and pieces left. <laughs> a ton of them. Like, I've got a whole drawer full of all these, <laughs> these nuts. And Nicole's like, are you supposed to have that many? I was like, yeah, they always give extras. <laughs> Just in case you lose some. Guys, just back me up on that this morning, right? And so when I build these things and I look down at this pile of stuff, the first thing before I build my confidence of going to Nicole, because if you look at Lily's dresser that I put together, it's like sagging in the middle right now. And Nicole's like, I'm like, I think it's just too full of clothes, Nicole. <laughs> but I always wonder, like, if I look at that, I'm like, is that the one piece? That as soon as Nicole comes up here and sees this and she goes, oh, this is great, and puts her hand on it, it just collapses. I'm worried about anything that I put together in our house that if you sit on it the right way, it might just fall down. So when you come over, just realize I put it together, right? <laughs> it could fall down at any moment, right? Here's the problem with putting knowledge on our heart thrones of our life. We keep searching for that missing piece of knowledge that will put us over the top. 
or will keep us from crumbling. So, so we either want that knowledge that makes us better than and knows more than everybody else, or if I don't have it, my life's going to totally crumble without it. But in reality, the missing piece of knowledge is why Jesus came in the first place. To give you a chance to be back with God. So we talk about the law here, and, and the law simply, we think, is like the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. Like, we're good with those. I got it. God, I'm not supposed to murder anybody. We got that one, right? Or I shouldn't steal somebody's stuff, right? Or I shouldn't covet things. I shouldn't want all this kind of stuff. And then you have the number one that says, Love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. And really, in all reality, if you don't keep number one, you're not going to keep number ten. You're not going to keep number two. You're not. You're just not going to. It's kind of that thing. But when you look at the law that the Israelites followed, there was actually 613 commandments that they had to follow. Um, I'm, I'm in the middle of that in my Bible reading right now. <clears throat> and, and it's about leprosy. Like if you have any kind of skin issue going on, you have to go cleanse yourself. And, and once they find you clean, you've got to be like isolated for seven days. And it's like 613. Um, you can't eat shrimp. Some people in here are seafood lovers. Like it literally says in the Bible, if it doesn't have a fin or scales, you're not allowed to eat it. So shrimps doesn't have fins or scales or octopus. You can't eat that. Or Brody, squid. Brody likes calamari. Um, you're not allowed to eat that, right? Or you're not allowed to eat pig. That's the big famous one, not allowed to eat pig. Or you're not allowed to um, eat goats, that kind of stuff, which we're okay with in America, <laughs> but uh, there's 613 of them, but those 613 isn't just a way to live, right? The law in and of itself is to show us that God is a holy God, that, that he's pure, that he is, um, <laughs> I don't mean to laugh about that, but that, that sorry was uh, just got me, you're all right, Becky, but I was like, did I say something wrong? I didn't, Mom, did I say something wrong? I thought that was my mom saying, sorry, stop. <laughs> um, and it, it shows that God is holy, and for us to approach God, we we have to be holy, right? For us to... Be in the presence of God, like Amber was talking about, the, the veil. For us to have approaching God, we've got to be holy as well. And that's hard sometimes. And the knowledge that we think is, hey, the more I know about God, the more holy I be. But, but really, in the sense is, Jesus' Jesus's life was to fulfill that holiness. All 613, or, or, or 613 of those laws, Jesus never broke. Not one time. He always loved God with his whole heart of every beat in his life. And he lived that life perfectly. Never thought of anything bad. Never said a bad word. And he did that to show you that, hey, listen, I was holy and now was led to a cross. And he died in our sacrifice. And he died this, this sacrificial death. And he had this burial punishment. To signify he is dead, he's buried. And an eradicating resurrection. Something that eradicated our punishment. He did that, so now when God looks down at a follower of Jesus, he sees a holy person. And when we hear that, we just absolutely go, what? And the missing piece of the law, the missing piece of all those commandments that these Pharisees and that these lawyers and that these scribes did not understand was simply this, the grace of God. That we know now that Jesus lived the life we couldn't, died the death we should, and rose again to give us a new life that we can have. And now we have a relationship with the Creator once you follow Jesus. And now what comes with it is grace, and that's the missing piece of all the knowledge. 
It's not that if you know more about God, then you'll act more like God. It is you have the ability now through Jesus and what he did to try to follow Jesus, but there's grace in that. Like, like we do with our kids, right, when we're teaching them to walk. You know, when they stumble, we don't laugh at them and say, that's stupid, get back up, right? We cheer them on with grace. So God, in the life of a follower, through the Holy Spirit, yes, it convicts you at times on the things that you do wrong, but it's more like a cheerleader when it's following you saying, get back up and take another step. My grace is sufficient in you. Look what my son did so you can have a relationship with me. So the missing piece of this law and knowledge that we need to have is grace. No matter what you know of Jesus, no matter what you know of God, no matter what you know of the Bible, Galatians 2, 15 through 16 says this, We ourselves are Jews, this is Paul, of course, writing to the church in Galatia, by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we, yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith and not by works of the law, but because by the works of the law no one is justified. That's a long way to say this. No one can be justified by the works of the law. Because none of us live up to the law. We are only justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Grace. Grace. Mark Batterson puts it this way. Why do we act as though our sin disqualifies us from the grace of God? That is the only thing that qualifies us. Anything else is a self-righteous attempt to earn God's grace. You cannot trust God's grace 99%. It's all or nothing. The problem, as I pointed out earlier, is that we want partial credit for our salvation. We want to be the 1% of the equation. But if we try to save ourselves, we forfeit the salvation that comes from Jesus Christ alone by grace through faith. For my life, that's where I struggle. I struggle with the fact that every time I mess up, I feel like I've lost it. I feel like that God's going to strike me down now. Because in reality, what happens is, I want that 1%. I want to feel special enough that I'm the 1%. And it's until I immerse myself with the grace, the missing piece of grace in the law, I'll never fully get the benefit of what grace does. Now, Mark Batterson's not telling us to go out and sin, and, and that way grace more abounds in your life. What he's saying is there is patience and grace in the journey of following Jesus. When you mess up, he gently picks you back up. When you fall and you feel like your life's out of control, he's there. Um, I don't like saying push you in the back because that signifies somebody's behind you on the journey. Um, and this is just a new realization in my life. He's there in front of you pulling you because he's already there. Right? It's, it's more, it's a picture of, man, if he's behind me, then I'm the one stepping out and nothing's there in front of me. But if he's pulling me, that means he's already cleared the way. And so the missing piece of grace in the law isn't just for our benefit. When we fail the law and sin, you know, that's not just for our benefit. That grace is not just when we fall and say, hey, listen, all God's given me grace. It's for us to look at others the way Jesus views us. Right? We now are more patient. We more have grace. We want to pull each other along in our journeys. With grace-filled eyes. The Pharisees didn't do this. They justified their actions in the law. And, and we'll get to that next week. How they justified and how they bent the law to justify everything that they did. Which means that there's got to be something because these guys knew everything about the Bible. For them to be in the spots and the positions that they were in, 
By the time that they were six years old, they had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. Right, those aren't the easy ones, right? I mean, if I'm going to have to memorize a book in the Bible, it's going to be John, for third, third John. It's like 17 verses, right? I mean, they're, they're learning, memorizing um, Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy. I mean, they're the real deal, like 613 laws. They had to memorize that by the time they were six years old. If they weren't, if they weren't there yet, they were told at six years old, go, le- go learn the father, your father's business. And at 12 years old, there was another cut and had to learn the next three books of the Bible. If they didn't make that cut, they were told, go learn your father's business. Now, if you start thinking about the disciples, they were fishermen, right? Matthew was actually named Levi, which his parents were expecting him to be a Pharisee, a, a priest, and he was a tax collector. So he flunked out. Right? All these other guys didn't have priest jobs. They didn't have Pharisee jobs. They didn't have Sadducee jobs. They were just normal people that basically got kicked out of school and had to go learn father's business. And Jesus picked them to share the greatest missing piece story in the history of time. I mean, Luke, who we're reading out of, was a doctor, he wasn't a priest. He didn't learn this. So these guys were the best of the best and they knew everything about it. And they didn't get it. And Jesus continually called them out because they knew the words and they didn't understand. Which means that there has to be something greater than just knowledge of God and His law. There has to be. Um, I'm reading a book right now called "There Has Some Something's Got to Change." And there's this there's this section in a chapter, and it's called. Tears into tactics. There's got to be something that drives your tears that when you see a broken world into some tactics into that broken world. And it's just simply this. Wisdom is greater than knowledge. Wisdom's greater than knowledge. And I used to hate tests when I was in school. I'm sure the guys up there in the back row, you guys hate tests, right? And now that I'm away from that and I really don't have to take any test anymore, um, I don't hate them as much. <laughs> That's easy for me to say because I don't have to take them anymore, right? But I don't hate them as much, but I really understand the purpose of them. So if I was to stand here and just teach everybody all day long and be like, hey, this is something to do with math because I'm not very good at it, but I don't even know a theorem. Um, Dave's laughing at me. Um, I want to say it, but I can't really say the, the word correctly, the polygraph or whatever, something in geometry. But, uh, you know. And I taught you guys this, did you really learn unless you could show me what it was? Right? Did you really learn that? You know? I don't know. I mean, Nick's doing an internship right now with a construction company, and that's kind of what they're showing him. Are you learning? Are you doing what you learned? Um, and on our hill journeys, we can learn and study about God and His Word all we want. But if we do not apply it to our lives, what use will it be? So the British Dictionary defines wisdom as this, the ability or result of an ability to think and act utilizing knowledge, experience, understanding, common sense, and insight. So wisdom, like how I like to put it in my just terms, is simply this, is taking steps with what you've been given. So if you know how to do it, you take the steps and you do it. Um, but the problem with the Pharisees and us at times is that we will take this knowledge that we have of, of Jesus, of God, and we'll just apply it to the things we need or do better than anybody else. We'll take the knowledge that we have and just be like, okay, I need this right now, so, you know, God, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, the plans you have for me, you got a plan for me to prosper. I'm claiming that one today because I need that. Or... The righteous stand. You stand alone, right? And you're like, oh, look at me. I know that, right? Um, Nicole's waiting for me to get back. I'll get to 29.7 here in a second, Nicole. Right? And that causes us just to focus on our journeys. I talk about this a lot. We just focus on the journey that we're on. Wisdom will put the action, the knowledge that we have. 
Solomon asked the greatest king of all time, the richest king of all time, the smartest king of all time, King Solomon, David's son, ask God for wisdom. In 1 Kings 3, 5, he said, ask, this is God, ask and it shall be given to you. That's way out of context. I didn't put the rest of them, all right? So don't be thinking this morning, Eric's telling me to ask and God. This was specific for Solomon, right? He said, God, he goes, you, you're righteous. I want to ask me and I'll give it to you. And Solomon answered this way in 1 Kings 3, 9. Give your, ser- your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to discern or be able to govern this great people. Solomon was about 14 years old when he became king. 14-year-old, a teenager, brand-new teenager. God asked him, ask for whatever you want. I'm going to tell you right now, my teenage years, the first thing I would ask for is, I want a Lamborghini. Or give me, give me much money that I can be like Scrooge McDuck. I want to swim in gold coins. Right? You guys, ducktails, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> um, that's what I would ask for. This 14-year-old said, I just want to be able to use the knowledge you've given me. Let me discern right. If knowledge is just for us to benefit with our relationship with God, then that is how we'll act towards the people around us. We'll act smarter. We'll act more blessed. We'll, we'll act more standoffish because nobody can compete with me. And and we'll act like we have all the answers. And we'll say, hey, you got to come to me to get the answer. This is what God... And and usually what will happen when somebody comes to you for help, you'll do more talking than they will (laughs) because you feel like you're now the missing piece because you have all this knowledge of God. But really, we should be pointing to the one who really has the answers. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is simply looking at God through the, through the lens of grace and seeing what he has done for you. Socrates says this. Now, I know this is odd because last week I quoted Harry Potter and Tupac, and now I've turned it to Socrates. I'm a real deep reader, right? Um, says this, wonder is the beginning of wisdom. Now, remember, wisdom's the ability to take knowledge and put feet to it. But you'll never put feet to something unless you wander in it. Like, one, wow. So here is where seeking knowledge of God is truly important. When we seek the knowledge of the nature of God, we find out that he's holy. But he's just as well. And through that just, he is merciful. And he's grace-filled. All at the same time. He follows the rules. He keeps the rules. But he also is full of grace. Everything at the same time. And that will lead our heart to wonder. Wonder of what Jesus did for us. Like excitement. A, I can't believe this happened. And that wonder leads to worship in our hearts, which will finally lead to us truly following Jesus in our hearts daily. So it all starts with learning, but it ends in following. It all starts with knowledge, but the feet becomes into the faith because of wisdom. And ultimately, this heart throne we've been talking about for the last few weeks equals worship. So why are you going to worship? You're going to worship all the knowledge you can gain, or are you going to worship the wonderful Prince of Peace, the Counselor, the one that puts feet to the faith, the one that says, now there is grace in your journey. So as I ask Amber to come back up, as we get ready to close up this morning, um, <clears throat> for me, this... You know, I always like to have like some personal stuff to my sermons, and, and um, I struggle a lot when it comes to knowledge. Um, I wasn't the best student in high school. wasn't bad in college, but um, I just wasn't the best. I didn't understand the point of it, didn't really. 
I liked hanging out more than I did going, like, learning things. I didn't miss a whole lot of school, and Dad said it wasn't because I wanted to learn a lot. It was because I was afraid I'd miss something if I wasn't at school, right? And, and until I realized that in my journey of, with Christ was, you know, I, I kind of took that into that. I'm like, wow, man, why do I read my Bible? Why do I do studies? Why? God, God's got me, right? But I, about three, four years ago, I realized I was having a worship problem. Uh, you might say, well, what do you mean, Eric? It's, it's more than just a Sunday like Amber was talking about. It's, it's more than just a Sunday thing. Like, I can come in here and get filled up. And those, 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 those mornings where I just feel like I can say amen. But it's more than just even listening to the song that I like every day. I'm never truly going to seek after the heart of God until I feel like that that God's enough. Right? And, and so I really, about four years ago, just said, you know what, I'm just going to start diving in. I want to learn more about God. I want to learn more about not just what the Bible says, but what the culture was like that, what the context was in that area. What was Jesus really saying to the people around there? Right? What was Jesus really saying, hey, this is how you should live? And, and so knowledge to me was never something I valued. It was never something I put on my heart, right? My heart felt. But now when I do it, and now I start, people will ask my opinion on things. It puffed me out a little bit, but I guess, had somebody write me the other night, a student that's getting ready to do a debate. I'm like, number one, don't use anything that I say in a debate. You might lose right off the bat. <laughs> but it made me feel good. Oh, man, I am smart, right? I am. And then I realized that it's not about my knowledge. It's about what I do with what Jesus asked me to do. And so the two questions as I'm ending this eve this morning is simply this. The first one is, have you found that missing piece? Have you sought after God and you found that missing piece of grace? Have you decided to say, you know what, that's what I want. I want it all to make sense. I want all this stuff that I'm learning to make sense, and it's actually causing me to step, right? I want to follow Jesus. If that's you this morning, I say it every week. Find me in the back, find my dad in the back, and we'll talk to you more about that. And the second question is this. Are you more concerned with gathering knowledge or spreading wisdom? <clears throat> so what Jesus is saying to these Pharisees at this moment is simply this. You just want to learn so much more so you look better in front of people, or how can you twist this law and get more than than everybody else are you more concerned with the gathering knowledge or spreading wisdom see see where the focus is on that the gathering is focused on you but the spreading is on everybody else so here's the actual feet to the knowledge that you need to have wisdom you are loved you are shown mercy you are shown grace there's the knowledge so here's the feat for wisdom of that. You are to be loving. You are to be merciful. You are to be filled with grace in your relationships around. Let's pray. You can stand. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. And Lord, I thank you for every bit of knowledge of your character that we've had through the history of time your creativity through nature your holiness through the law your grace filled life through the New Testament but Lord what I ask this morning is let's just take a step further and let's take that knowledge turn it into wisdom and apply it to our lives and however that goes let us have feet 
make the knowledge real in our lives and how we can recall it and how we can make this world a better place like Jesus did. The smartest, the most full knowledge person to ever walk this earth and in turn gave us this gift of salvation through his death, burial, and resurrection. Because he knew that knowledge of the law turned into wisdom. And that wisdom turned into just stepping out. So this morning, whatever time we have left, Lord, let us live for you. And we ask this in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen.